Hello and welcome to this Wound Care Today Facebook Live seminar. My name is Alison Schofield and I'm a tissue viability team lead and clinical nurse specialist. And today we'll be looking at self-care. If you've joined us before, you will notice that things look a little bit different. I am live streaming this session tonight from my own home, so please forgive the slight change of format. We will still be taking your questions as usual, so please comment on the video throughout and we will do our very best to answer as many questions at the end. This event today is kindly supported by Essity. After the event, you can access a certificate of attendance, which you will be able to use as part of your CPD hours for revalidation. We will be sharing the link at the end of the presentation, so please stay with us until the very end. During this presentation, I invite you to think about the patients currently on your caseload. Which of these patients have the potential to self-care? How can you use the learnings from the presentation to initiate a discussion about self-care? So now we'll move on to the presentation itself entitled Self-Care in the Current Climate. So key learning outcomes for this evening will be to understand why the need for patient self-care is becoming ever more important, no more important than right now. To understand the challenges that this can present to understand the benefits to patients and clinicians such as yourselves, to discuss the ways to help and achieve successful patient partnerships and be able to identify patients who are capable of self-management. So what is self-care? It's used interchangeably with self-management, self-regulation, -reg patient involvement and partnership, patient education and patient counselling. Self-management is development beyond the practice of giving information and increasing patient knowledge. It's about giving the patient that autonomy within the care planning that we do every day. We know there are changes in, in the current climate. It's all around us. And I am a, a community nurse by background. And the number of district nurses in 2018 for a population of 55.8 million in England alone were estimated to be just 4,000. In the UK since 2010, there has been a 46% reduction from just over 4,000 to 4,000 qualified district nurses. This is the worst ever staffing crisis. There is a, a shortage of 41,722 nurses in England. Nurses are leaving the profession um, by natural um, retirement, but also because of other reasons and going into different employment. This has increased by 51% since 2013 to 2017, just a four year period. So we have the NHS long-term plan, and this, is, um, this has within it supporting people in the community with complex long-term conditions. There are 15 million people in England with long-term conditions, so we need to change how we deal with this. So we need to get our organisations on board with supporting these processes. The patient and the, the person must be at the centre always of a coordinated care. They must be engaged, informed, as individuals and the carers on board as, to, as well. And us as healthcare professionals need to be committed to that partnership working. There is a self-care continuum that you can see on screen now. So this is about taking responsibility for own health and care. Now it starts from diet, exercise, right through to major trauma, so healthy living, minor conditions, long-term conditions, and in-hospital care. Patients often follow that cycle of care and go round different services, so it's taking that autonomy of that holistic care. We know there are changes in the current climate with the COVID-19 pandemic, not only to this country, but obviously this is worldwide so it's almost fast forwarded the need and readiness to embrace self-management there is a need for patients to engage and adopt a self-management routine it's important more than ever 
we know we have limited nurse contacts now with patients. Things are being prioritised. Patients might be under, unable to attend particular clinics. GP surgeries are prioritising and we can't just go routinely like we normally did. Patients will be self-isolating. There is temporary closure of services. Um, in my trust alone, our chronic wound clinic has closed its doors and staff are visiting patients at home, but we are encouraging a self-management policy within that and a pathway for patients. And nurse time has been diverted. There will be many of you watching tonight who will be in changing roles, upskilling in different services and being redeployed. The National Wound Care Strategy Programme has been commissioned by NHS England and NHS Improvement to improve the prevention and care of pressure, leg and foot ulcers and surgical wounds. There is written literature and videos to support self-management in wound care via their websites. There is such as how to care for your wound, shared care for wounds, looking after your leg ulcer, advice for people with lymphedema, and how to manage skin tears and pressure ulcers. For the lower limb, there are practical videos available to show how to wash your legs and change your dressing safely, one which I actually did myself, application of different compression systems, including hosiery and wrap systems. The lower limb work stream of the National Wound Care Strategy Programme is fully supportive of a self-care pathway for patients and carers even beyond this current crisis. The national strategy is supporting clinical staff, patients and carers with information. It, it is available on the website, the address is there and we can share that with you. So we have challenges within wound care, we know that. Traditionally, healthcare professionals have undertaken most aspects of chronic wound management. The underlying etiology, if you think about it, such as venous disease, chronic edema, diabetic lower limb wounds, we've been the ones to take control of that as specialists. The patient comes into the clinic and says, here you are, nurse, there's my leg. Well, we need to kind of turn that system around. We need the patient to be at the centre of that care. There are an increasing number of patients with wounds. We know that from Julian Guest's great work and data analysis. There's an increase of 12% a year in chronic wounds, and that is ever growing. Patients have an expectation as a part of a holistic wound assessment, but we need to be asking them, how involved would you like to be in the care of your wound? That is okay to do that. Historically, that's not something that we've done. It might be unfamiliar to us and the patient, but we need to change our ways of working. The use of technology for telecommunication, also, this isn't used much throughout the UK, but at times like this um, um, current situation, it would be very useful. We can use this for triaging and help and support, if you think in care settings like nursing homes, care homes, and for patients themselves to communicate with us. So let's introduce ourselves to self-management. There was a review of 550 high quality research articles and from that we derived it is worthwhile to support self-management in particular through focusing on behaviour change and supporting self-efficiency. Supporting self-management has the potential to alleviate the pressure of health and social services caused by workforce shortages. The rising demand for services, population increase, we know the ageing population is ever growing and also those budgetary constraints on the NHS and other services. So what does self-management really mean? It's the actions which individuals take to lead a healthy lifestyle, so to meet their social, emotional and psychological needs to care for their long-term conditions and to prevent further illness or accidents. The involvement of family and carers in this is crucial to its success and it's such a simple concept really but often we overlook it. It's key to improve move, mood and reduce anxiety. How many patients have you got at the moment who are so anxious 
other carers, other nurses come in, you know, are they in isolation themselves? You know, what's happening, what's going on? And the potential benefits of this are substantial. So who can self-manage? So our patients need to be willing, they need to be on board, we need to give them um, full information so that they, they um, are motivated to be part of this care planning. They need to be health literate, so they need to have um, capacity to be able to understand their own condition and how to support in managing that. They have to be at the centre of your decision making. They have to be part of that decision making and care delivery. And they must feel supported within it. There are different coping strategies within situations that people do adopt. And some of these we can see on the table on screen now. So some people adopt an active approach. So they, they seem to remain calm. They see things from all sides, so the bigger picture. And then they like to work towards a solution. Some people look at a palliative approach. So they look for a distraction. They just keep busy and they don't really want to think about what's going on. There is an avoidance approach. Let's see the situation, um, let, just let the situation be, and they avoid um, um, kind of what is going on around them. There is a social support strategy. So some people look to others for comfort. They want to really share their troubles, and they are the ones that will ask for help. There's a passive response. So they are completely so engrossed with the situation. They become so anxious and worried. And then they become so isolated because of that. I think we can probably relate to that with everything that's going on at the current time. There's an expression of emotions response. So some people will display anger because they just don't know how else to express themselves. And for them, it's releasing tension and anxiety. And some have reassuring thoughts, so they reassure themselves and they think, well, worse things can happen at sea, things happen to other people, and that makes them feel courageous through that. We might see ourselves in many of these coping strategies, and certainly the patients that we know too. There are discussion tools um, that we can use with patients to help them through. So if we look at patients' views and understanding, um, so we want to ask patients, why do they have a wound? Do they understand why it's there? So if you think, for example, um, why somebody would have um, venous disease and, and do they understand the, um, the, the processes of why that is happening? Would they like to learn more about the wounds that they have? How do they feel about the wound itself that they've got? Any fears or concerns, what worries them most? It might be different for different people. So some people will worry about pain aspects, some will be odour, some will be leakage. It will vary from person to person. Does the wound affect their life? So it is affecting elements of their quality of life and there are particular assessments related to that. Does it affect their relationships? So their partner or spouse that they live with, um, their family around them. Maybe it's family and carers who come in to help them. And at times like this, they're not having the, um, the, the contact from that. What is important to them? So looking at short-term goals and long-term goals. What is their priority of wound healing? Remember, not all wounds will heal. And for some patients, it's not the end goal of the wound healing. That is the most important thing. It's the here and now, what is happening, symptom management, and their willingness to be involved. What do they need to know? What can they do to help? What's their environment like where they live? Are they able to cope with self-management within this situ their situation? And who else do they have to help at this time? There is a simple tool that's been developed by, by SAT, and this is brand new for this evening that we're sharing with you, and it's ready to download after the event. So this is a tool that will help you understand which of your patients have the capacity to self-care. So it looks at physical and mental ability, their support and situation, and their motivation that they will need. So now we're gonna just show you a short video that will go through this tool with you.
I hope you enjoyed the video. So in general, principles when supporting self-management are including the patient in all decisions that are made. Planning care, we have care plans for wound care, we have them for lower limb management, but what about care plans for self-management? So we need to develop these in partnership with our patients. We need to set goals, remember long-term, um, short-term goals, and ensure follow-up on achievements. So what is important? What's the goal for the patient? And make sure that these are being followed on. Keep evaluating at all points. We need to monitor um, patient symptoms and they need to know when to take action in the event of any red flags, anything changing or going wrong. So that could be in uh, printed information. You know, do, pa do patients have um, like a, a wound care diary, a passport, for example? Have they got the ability or any, any equipment to take photographs of their wounds? And can they share that with you? We need to ensure we are motiv motivating patients. So how do we go about that? And advocate those healthy lifestyles, diet, exercise. We can do all these things at home. You know, there are so many online tools. There's stuff on the, on the television at the moment. So um, looking out for these things and sharing them with patients to be engaged. And educating patients on their particular condition and how to self-manage that. So if somebody's got venous disease, you know, the importance of keeping on with their routine of their, you know, hosiery and wraps to, um, to, to, to manage that, that venous disease so they don't have a recurrence of leg ulcers. We know holistic assessment of the patient is vital in all cases, so it's no different to this um, self-manage um, pathway either. So um, this is a, a really good framework um, for holistic assessment and it's called CASE and it involves the patient at all stages. So we're looking at the cause of the wound, the assessment of the wound, so we're informing the patient at these stages, selection of treatment and product. How can they manage with those? And then the ongoing evaluation that we've talked about. So I just want to introduce a couple of um, case studies. And these particular case studies come from my own trust. So I am obviously very familiar with them. And they involve um, working towards a self-management pathway. So case study one is an 83-year-old gentleman. He presented to um, his GP in 2012 with a, a lower limb wound. He had a laceration and after eight weeks, he was not getting any healing and he was concerned. He also had some pit and edema present. So over this, over this um, case study and this time period, the patient would be going on and off to the GP practice nurses with dressings and, and no particular way forward. In 2013, he was diagnosed with having varicose eczema and he was prescribed a uh, steroid cream. In 2014, his edema continued in the affected leg. He had um, more leg ulcers, he kept knocking his leg. Um, he had, um, 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 you know, from the venous varicose eczema, he had, was scratching and then got a wound through that. The GP at this time then prescribed diuretic, diuretics because he had swelling in the leg and we know this isn't the correct treatment. And also antibiotics for suspected cellulitis. The legs were then described in documentation as a different color. Now we know from venous disease, it could be brown staining, hemosiderin staining, it could be red leg syndrome, which is an inflammation of the tissues. And this is perfectly normal within venous disease. It doesn't mean that somebody has cellulitis and requiring constant antibiotics. This patient had, had had knee surgery three years previously, so the GP asked for an MRI of the knee because they thought it could be related to that. So over the next few years, the patient continues on and off to see the GP, uh, applying dressings and things at home, but no particular way forward. In 2017, the edema in the leg is continuing. It's increasing and the patient is struggling to walk and has got an achy leg. The GP then doubled the diuretics and prescribed more antibiotics. I can hear you all at home going, oh my goodness, yes, we've seen patients like this and we are familiar with this. 
In 2019, there was a change in course. The practice nurse at this surgery had undertaken our in-house trust leg ulcer training program. So then they recognized there was something wrong, they recognized the venous disease, and they referred to the tissue viability service. So we completed a full low assessment of this gentleman. We diagnosed venous leg ulcer. We did a Doppler. His ABPI was one, which we know is normal. And his ulcers were not leaking excessively. So we were able to apply dressings, but with a hosiery kit prescribed as first line treatment. That is on our pathway. And I'll explain about the hosiery kits and the way they work shortly. So this is the gentleman when he came in. You can see um, to the inner aspect of his leg there, he's got an ulcer, chronic ulcer. He's got pale granulations. It doesn't look particularly healthy. He's got macerated skin surrounding there. And he's got some edema to his leg. And he's got other wounds to the side there, which has come from scratching and itching from his uh, venous eczema. So we'll go through the assessment of how the patient can self-manage. So physically and mentally, the patient could reach, he could apply a dressing himself, he could remove the, remove the compression hosiery kit, and he lived with his daughter. Um, so she was able to help with this treatment as well. He had capacity, so he understood the need for this treatment plan. He didn't want to be attending the clinic every week, twice a week. So he was quite happy with this plan of care to be coming every you know, few weeks or, or whenever he felt he needed to come in, but not ev every week. So we had support from his daughter, we know that, and there were no financial constraints to him that would be a barrier. So we have to look at all these situations. He had the motivation. He was willing, a willing patient. He was able to engage. Um, so at first, so, so he prescribed the hosiery kit, and um, he was struggling with that. He just, he, he, he wasn't, you know, he was a man. He wasn't comfortable with wearing it. He felt like he was wearing a stocking. So we discussed other options with him, and that's the thing to do is to keep reevaluating your plan of care. So we looked at wrap, at wrap systems. So this gentleman was prescribed a job sparrow wrap. Um, it was discussed with him and his daughter at a, a, an appointment together. And so they, they were happy to perform the wound care. So at this current time with the social distancing, they are happy, they're in a house together, they, they've got the red flag information and they will contact our services if they need to. But I can tell you that his wound has nearly healed, which is fantastic news for him. So case study two, this is a 57-year-old lady with diabetes who is on insulin. She had hypertension and had obesity. Now, she first presented with leg ulcers in 1999. Now, that's over 20 years ago. She um, attended the practice nurse. She had dressings applied on, you know, weekly, three times a week. Um, she had steroid cream and multiple courses of antibiotics for suspected cellulitis. She had 25 courses in all. Now, as we said before, it's possible that she just had red leg syndrome. It's probably just venous stain into the legs and wasn't cellulitis on all occasions. In 2008, the practice nurse asked, had she ever had compression therapy? The patient herself could not recall. There was nothing in the note documentation. But in this particular practice, at this time, this was not something that they provided as a service. In 2007, she was eventually referred to the chronic wound clinic that we have in our trust. She had a full holistic assessment. Her ABPI Doppler was 0.97, which we know is normal. She had edema to one of her legs and she needed that reshaping. She had blistering, you can see from the uh, photo on the right hand side of the screen, which were weeping quite a bit. So we, we um, had a short stretch bandage system which was applied to reduce the edema, reshape the leg and reduce the exudate. So she, she went on to, you know, virtual healing, um, but she was having some bandage slippage. As the legs go down, sometimes this happens. So she had hosiery prescribed, and then that continued into maintenance after the leg ulcer had healed. 
we want the, the, the hosiery maintenance for less recurrence. So this patient, though, she kept removing it. She was saying she found it uncomfortable. So then she ended up with rebound edema. So that's the edema, the swelling coming back because the compression's not in place. So again, discussion with the patient, re-evaluation of this care planning, and a wrap system was discussed and eventually prescribed. So the patient found the wraps easier to apply and she lived with her husband and he would help her with it and they found that that easy because often wrap systems will come in a foot piece um, and then a, a calf piece so with velcro fastening they are really easy to apply and quite comfortable to wear so they understood the treatment and care that they needed and the product choice helped with concordance so often you'll find, you know, we, we sometimes say, don't we, that patients, um, or they're not being concordant with their compression. And we want them to really achieve the full compression because that's the best therapy. So it's better to look at what is right for them, you know, different things to different individuals. So this patient could reach, apply, remove the compression map. Uh, they both understood everything and they had support from the clinical team. So they had the red flag information. They had numbers to contact for the clinic to call staff um, if, if they needed to. And importantly, then, so they didn't feel abandoned. They were not anxious in any way at all. They were part of that team. They were willing and actively able to self-manage. And this is recentness. So during the uh, COVID um, outbreak that's occurred, um, this patient is still ongoing with their wound, although it has improved greatly. But they are able and feel um, less anxious to be at home caring. Um, they, they initially had, um, you know, what we class as a negative experience with the hosiery. But with good patient discussion, discussions and the RAP systems, this has changed to a positive experience. So we talked about the two layer compression kits. So what are they if you're not familiar? So they come in um, um, with a liner layer. This is a, 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 a thinner layer, um, quite silky, nice and easy to apply. And then another stocking which goes over the top. So together this provides 40 milligrams of mercury compression at the ankle and graduating up the leg. Exactly the same as a full layer compression bandage system. So this will enable the patients to self-care independently at home. Um, it's easy to put on and take off. Now, we mentioned the National Wound Care Strategy uh, Programme web website with videos. There is one on there um, that shows um, hints and tips of how to take, put on and take off hosiery. It's, it, it is quite simple when you know how. It's ideal for patients to manage their own dressing changes as well, because if we can manage the extra date, then they can have a dressing underneath this system. It's like having a bandage. And it enables patients to shower, bathe, skin care, so important, and to wear their normal shoes. They kind of feel like it's normal practice. And it's suitable for leg ulcer management and to prevent recurrence. So the wrap compression systems, these are easy to apply and they can be adjusted by patients to accommodate that reducing edema. So this is like a short stretch bandage. We don't get that rebound edema with the short stretch system. So as the leg reduces, goes down, the re edema reduces, then they can, they can readdress, they can re-pull round <coughs> the, um, the, the compression system. They are ideal for patients to manage their own dressing changes, as with the hosiery kits. Patients can care for their skin, and it provides that great con graduated compression. FT have provided patient information leaflets, so we've got the uh, jobs to also care for the kit and also for the Farrah wrap range. So you can get these um, from the FT website and you can print them off and give them to patients or show patients and they can view them online. <coughs> now we mentioned about dressings going underneath the hosiery kits and wraps. Um, and it's important for you to follow your formularies and the advice of your tissue viability nurses and specialists as to what dressings you have there in use. 
Now, one product um, that we're going to showcase to you today is Cutimed Sorbax, and it's a bacteria binding dressing. It manages infection effectively. So this can stay in place for up to seven days, which is ideal in the current climate. Um, and if appropriate, patients can change their secondary dressing. So they might have a super absorbent or an, an absorbent pad over the top, for example. Um, so they might change that, but they can leave the Cutimed Sorbax in place. It, there's no contraindications or known risk of allergic reaction. So it's a safe dressing to manage microbial load in wounds which are at risk. So like a prophylaxis really of infection. So we have a, a call to action. So to help nurses understand if their patients have the capacity to self-manage at the moment, SET are offering the following. There are self-care guides for healthcare professionals. They are free to download and the websites are available. We can share those with you. There are self-care booklets for the patients like we just showed you and they're available by opting in when you download your certificate at the end of this presentation. Other tools are also being developed which will be available shortly. So ask your local SET account managers for more information on that. So in conclusion, there are many terms to describe self-management. We need to learn from chronic disease management. And there are tools available that can help us to decide if a patient is ready to self-management. Self-management is a component of holistic wound care, which we carry out all the time. So let's not forget that. And there again, we have the call to action. So now we're going to move on to our real-time question and answer session. So remember, you can take part at any time by commenting on the video. So let's move on to our first question. If I can see that on the screen, I can. So question one, are there any reasons why I can't discuss self-care with all my patients? So if you think of the tools that we've, we've been talking about to move through, so um, is the patient willing for a part? Um, and, and capacity of the patient. So it's about those conversations with the patient themselves. If a patient is deemed not to have capacity, and we know that, we can have those conversations with the families, with their carers, and it may be that they can be involved in this. We're not talking about the patient being left to it and just to get on with their own wound care. This is about part of a, a of, of, of a team, of a, of a care planning with us as healthcare professionals. So really we are, we are asking them to be participant within their care planning. So is there a question two? So willing is a, I'm being asked, willing is a big problem with some patients who decline to do their own wound management, although they are capable how do they address this? And yeah, I mean, historically for years, like I say, I, I used to be a, a community nurse in district nursing before I was a tissue viability nurse, you know, over the past, what, 20 years. And, and I think it, it's that historic um, way that we've always worked, you know, where in, in a sense of like, we've, you know, we, we've always, you know, we've taken that care ourselves that, you know, we've told patients not to touch their wounds and, um, and, 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 that, and that's how, and sometimes with the older generation, that's how they see it as well. So I think if we inform our patients um, on, you know, what, what, what their condition is and, you know, and, and, and allow them really in a way to, to be part of this and say, it is okay, you can change that dressing. Um, you can be involved and I think it's it's motivational isn't it motivational aspects and we won't we won't be able to enable all patients to self-care but I think we can certainly engage a, a high number of them so question three can we explore reasons for non-compliance and whether there are things we can work with is it pain fear um, alternative lifestyle etc Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Um, Non-concordance, non-compliance. And, and we, we always need to explore the reasons for this. And often there will be a reason behind it. You know, some, you, you can go in 
you know, to do something and somebody tells you, you know, no, I don't want to see you today. It's not time. I don't want that compression on. Nerve. I don't want, you know, full compression. It's terminology as well. We talk about therapeutic compression, not tight, full compression. Um, and it might be that somebody's got increased pain or there's extra day. There could be just other things going on in their life. So that's all part of that holistic assessment. We talked about social, emotional, psychological aspects. So we need to explore every aspect of that to see if we can make any 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 changes and, and to help them. So the next question is, would a phone call review and evaluation be acceptable from time to time instead of a face-to-face -face review? Um, yeah, and um, you know, in some parts of the country, this is kind of starting to take place. Um, you know, triaging of, um, we, you know, we mentioned about telecommunications, for example, which is a fantastic tool. And if our patients can um, be part of this, Absolutely, we you know give them. We need to give them the contact numbers anyway. But if we can talk them through and reassure them, um, if they can take and share photographs with us, for example, then absolutely. I think this is in this. I mean, not just at this time, but in the future, these are aspects of care that we have to be moving towards. The next question is: How do you suggest this is carried out if there are no healthcare professional face-to-face -face contacts. Um, well, I mean, you know, we, we, we would hope that there would be healthcare professional contact within part of this planning. Like I said, we're not expecting patients to be abandoned just to get on with their own care. I know things have changed very much at the moment. Um, if patients are in care homes, for example, we have carers there, they might not be qualified nurses, but um, you know, we, we want to try and work with them um, and carers who are going into, into patients' homes to be aware and to be able to contact us. Um, engaging the families um, and um, anybody who is there around in the house but we can't abandon our patients you know so we need, need to make sure if, if there are there are always going to be some patients who who um, we will need to still go and visit and we will follow the guidance of what is happening within our local trust and nationally at the moment would you recommend documenting patient agreements to self-care um, absolutely. Um, you know, like I said before, we do have care planning on wound care, on leg ulcer management. Maybe it's the time we need to start ma um, making care plans which relate to um, self-management care as well. Um, we, you know, we, we can make, I mean, we always should make individualized care plans anyway, but if we make care plans with the patient, um, and then we can, you know, it, it's almost an agreement that we'll, they will take on self-care but not all, all just about self-care of you change the dressing etc but also within that lifestyle of um you know about diet exercise people taking that accountability and responsibility of their long-term conditions lots of questions today so the next one is do you find patients and carers expect a community nurse to dress their wound and do you think we have to begin by changing the model of community nursing to involve a self-care element. My goodness, yes. And it's, do you know what? This has been talked about anyway, prior to the COVID crisis. Um, I work a lot with the National Wound Care Strategy Team. And within that, there are work, um, work streams. And one of them is a, a lower limb work stream, for example. And the, already there's been um, tools developed which are looking at um, self-care as part of the patient pathways so this isn't just something new it's just kind of been accelerated it's been moved towards us because of the current situation and climate but um for you know in in the future we definitely need to be to be looking at self-care as a part of everything that we do at the moment, we're unable to carry out, somebody say, Doppler tests. If there are no signs and symptoms of arterial involvement or any issues identified, you know, what, what can we do? Um, this is 
this is something that um, I've, I've heard happening and, you know, in, in various trusts throughout the country. I'm in touch nationally with a lot of nurses um, and tissue viability nurses. And because um, we are prioritising the work that we do at the moment, one of the some things are, are being put as non-essential care and um, Doppler's new assessments and things like that are, are part of that programme. I understand that. Um, I think one thing I want to say, though, is that we can't forget everything. We can't forget every other thing that a patient has. And if we leave um, lower limb management, for example, then we're going to have that, that crisis of, that, of, of what we know to be, um, a, a, you know, within the numbers in venous leg, leg ulcers for example, it's just going to skyrocket. So we, we have to be sensible and we have to still enable that patient to get um, implementations and diagnostic treatment. But something that you can do, and this is from the best practice document, until the patient can get a full lower limb assessment, including Doppler, if they have no signs of arterial disease, and please look at the best practice statements to get the information of this, you can safely apply a dressing and the class one hosiery to the patient's leg, and that will then um, aid their venous return until they can get that full assessment. Do you think hosiery kits and wraps, somebody is asking, could be beneficial when patients are admitted to acute hospital? Um, this is something that um, has been discussed um, for a long time, um, and we know um, it, it's difficult. Gosh, my goodness, it's especially difficult at the moment um, for, for patients, um, for staff in, in the acute setting to be continuing with um, with. Uh, particular aspects of care. Um, so yeah, absolutely, hosiery kits and wraps. If somebody's already been assessed, they've got the assessment for that and they go in, then that care should be continued, definitely. Should we be making self-care the norm? Yes, in my opinion, yes. Um, it's not been the norm at all, but like I said, there are, you know, nationally, um, NHS England, NHS Improvement have been wanting to work towards this self-care um, model. Um, so, you know, I think as, as, as we go on in time, as generations change, um, we, we, you know, especially after what's happening at the moment, in all aspects of care, self-management of our own health will become very, very important. Patients, somebody say, may find self-care daunting. Absolutely. And how can we help patients to have confidence in their initial dressing change routine until they become more experienced? Of course it is. I mean, you know, we're healthcare professionals. We're used to this. Um, if you think of, you know, anybody in your own family, for example, you know, that your parents, that, that, that would be quite a daunting thing to do. You've got a wound, you've got a wound that's leaking, you've got compression in place, etc. So, but we need to make sure they have the full information um, that they are consenting to be part of self-care and they always have information about the red flags and they have the contact, contact numbers to be able to get in touch with them, with us about this but there are there are um like a, there's a video that i've done for example as i said it's on the national wound care strategy program it's practical straightforward shows somebody how to change a dressing wash their leg reapply their dressing so you know please share that with them there's literature that you can print off from there as well um, you know you could support them in a visit get them to do it themselves and then they'll feel confident and then you can move away how would you like a, look after a non-compliant patient? Somebody's saying, you know, this, this, this isn't an unusual thing to us in, in healthcare, is it? I'm not in wound care, I'm certainly not in leg ulcer care. Um, so, you know, we have to go through all those processes. And like I said, not, not everybody's going to be on board um, with, um, with the, the care plans that we are offering. So we just have to make sure somebody's safe. If somebody is declining, 
any element of compression. You know, we, maybe that you can look at a reduced compression at this time. Ultimately, full therapeutic compression is the, the most vital thing that we can apply for somebody's healing. But maybe you could look at a different, different compression system and a reduced compression. You just need to make sure, you know, that they, they're not getting wound infection and they're not getting any deterioration. So just keep at it, keep revisiting, keep talking to the patient. How we covered from an NMC MDU perspective of how patients don't follow our advice when at home. Well, you know, we, we all, as qualified nurses, we work within the um, NMC code of conduct. So we have to ensure that we are, um, you know, um, working to the code of conduct. Um, if patients, if we, if we are aware and made aware that patients are not following our advice and if they are at risk and there is a safety compromise, then we have to revisit and change that plan of care. Um, so, you know, be sensible really, you know, and work with your patients. Um, but they, you know, we, we're looking at patient autonomy, but we, you know, we need to make sure that they have full capacity, for example. Um, somebody's asking, should we be on first visit? Should we be on first visit promoting self-care with a visual aid like leaflets and trust leaflets? We should do that anyway. I mean, we do that for things like, we should be doing things like that for pressure ulcer prevention, for example. Um, so, so, and at this time, it's really important. So we, you, there's so much information out there at the moment. National Wound Care Strategy, as I keep reiterating, has so much literature. <laughs> Excuse me. If you can get this information and just take it to the patients, the videos. I mean, you know, I think majority of people, even my parents now have an iPad and can access the internet. I never thought that would happen. But you know, if if um, I think a lot of people have are able to do that. So, you know, it, we have to keep sharing with our patients um, the information that's out there. So I think this now concludes our live training session. So I want to thank you all for watching and submitting your questions. We really hope you found it useful. I'd like to finish, finish off by thinking um, about the patients that you have been considering throughout this presentation. Which of them could be um, self-care in reality uh, working with you right now? So think about what will your next step be when you go back into practice, going through your, your caseload, you've been told that we've got to reduce the visits down, you know, we might have changing roles and, you know, in, as other tissue viability nurses, many of us are being redeployed, so we're kind of forward thinking and forward planning. I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank Essity for their support of this event and Wound Care Today. And to access your certificate of attendance, visit the link shown on screen now, or alternatively, it will be pinned in the comments. I really hope you've enjoyed this event today. I have very much. And I hope you feel more confident in exploring the benefits of self-care with your patients. There's lots to come and there's lots for us to talk about, but you know, th this is just the start really. If you like the Wound Care Today Facebook page, um, then you will hear first about future events. And there are many fantastic things coming up. So thank you all so much. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Please stay safe and take care out there. Lots of love.